What I am going to try and talk to you today about is why innovation is so important in major engineering infrastructure industries and what are some of the forces that drive innovation and how you learn to innovate before you have to and how challenging that can be in major infrastructure businesses. Now, as it was said at the beginning, I spent most of my career in the oil and gas industry. And the oil and gas industry is absolutely fascinating for many, many reasons. But not least because you actually have no direct control over the price of your product. Yeah, it's set by geopolitical considerations. This is oil price going back over 100 years. And um, you have no control over the price of your product at the end of the day, but you absolutely, of course, have to learn to respond to it. Now, that might make you think that we're sort of victims of a set of political circumstances in the oil and gas industry. Well, that isn't true, actually. The oil price speaks peaks and troughs they may be politically driven, but actually they're fundamentally technology driven. They're driven by underlying technology and innovation. So if you take the oil price today, $44 a barrel, and the collapse in oil price today, you may read in the newspapers that it's driven by the Saudis flooding the market with oil, and you may think it's geopolitics and all the rest of it. Why are they doing that? They're doing it because they're trying to price out of the market oil shale in the United States that's flooding the market because of technology. Technology has unleashed enormous quantities of oil and gas that only a few years ago we didn't know existed. Do you know today, for example, that the, the global gas reserves are enough to, at current demand rates to sustain the world's gas demand for 200 years. And that's happened just in the last few years as fracking technology has fundamentally transformed the oil and gas industry. Now, why do I want to talk about this? Well, because innovation, when you're in the, in the industry and you're in these peaks and troughs, I tell you what, it's pretty tough. Because when its oil prices are high, everything is wonderful. You're making lots of money, and actually, innovation is not really a strong driving force. It's about production, get out there, produce as quick as you can. Then you have an oil price crash, and then suddenly you need to be innovative. Suddenly it's, well, how are we going to do this for half the price? How are we going to develop the technology that is needed? And I started my career actually 35 years ago or so in the North Sea at a time of extraordinary technological innovation. This was the poster, actually, that attracted me as a young engineer in 1980 to want to be part of the oil and gas industry because I'd wanted to be part of the moon landing when I was a kid, and I couldn't be because I was too old for it. But I thought, well, here's the imagery. This is obviously the equivalent of putting a man on the moon today, and it really was. The 1980s and the 1970s were, in the North Sea, the time of extraordinary innovation. The underwater manifold center, the device here, this was the first major underwater system installed anywhere in the world. It was built in the North Sea. And when we sanctioned that project, we did not know how to do it. Yeah, so the decision was taken, we're going to develop this field, but we didn't have all the technology. We didn't know how we had to, were going to do it. It forced innovation in the organization and in the industry, and it was absolutely thrilling to be there. So my point here is that innovation can be sort of forced upon a big organization or a major industry by, uh, by price signals, um, but those price signals are in themselves actually driven by the underlying innovation of the industry themselves. There are other things that tragically can also drive innovation in major infrastructure industries. Now, these are two disasters in the two industries that I've worked in that occurred within months of one another in 1988. The Clapham train crash on the left and the Piper Alpha disaster on the right. 
Combined, over 200 people lost their lives in these two tragedies. These two tragedies fundamentally changed the way our infrastructure industries, whether in oil and gas or in rail, approached the issue of technical safety. Huge innovation was born from these terrible tragedies. And I'm really proud today to say that the Britain's railway is now the safest railway in Europe. This is the number of fatal train crashes going back to 19, 1960. The number of fatal train crashes since 1960 in, the, in Britain. And the last fatal train crash we had was in 2007 when one person lost their life. So we have the safest railway in Europe today and it is driven by innovation, technology, and really brilliant engineering carried out by tens of thousands of network rail and industry people across, um, across uh, the industry. So what this shows is that the railway industry can innovate. The railway industry can, when it has to, be creative and come up with new solutions to problems. The problem is, are the signals that require innovation strong enough? And do you feel those signals strongly enough and in time to actually generate the change? This is the railway industry, the past and the present. And the reason I show this is because you might look at this and say, well, there's a lot of, there's some, been some innovation in the industry here. Well, there has and there hasn't. Actually, the innovation is really quite modest by the standards that many of your companies would represent. Yes, we've changed the way in which we pull the carriages. We now use diesel or electric. This is diesel. We now use diesel or electric instead of steam. But fundamentally, actually, it's unchanged. And I would highlight one thing in particular that is completely unchanged, and that is the signaling. So on the left-hand side, you see the, the signaling system, the semaphore signaling system, invented in 1840. This is a binary communication system between the fixed infrastructure and the rolling infrastructure. It's basically a traffic light. It's red or it's green. Well, we, we've now got yellow as well, but it's basically red or green. You can either stop or you can go. That's the way we communicate between track and train. It's still the way we communicate today between track and train. It is unchanged since 1840. And to me, that is an area of rich opportunity for us in the oil and, ga in the, um, oil and gas, <laughs> in the railway uh, sector. And why is it important? Well, it is actually massively important. You know, today our railway is the fastest growing railway in Europe. It is an extraordinary success. Four and a half to five million people every day depend on rail travel to get to and from work, to meet friends and family, to go on holiday. It is the economic artery of our country. But it's growing faster and faster and faster, faster than anywhere else in Europe. We're investing more than anywhere else in Europe. As I've already said, we have the safest railway in Europe and we have just about the lowest subsidy of any railway in Europe. It's an extraordinary success story. And over the next 25 years, you know what? It's gonna double again. So I ask you, how are we going to cope with twice the number of passengers on trains wanting to travel uh, than we have today? Well, of course, part of the answer lies in new railway systems. We've got HS1, we will have HS2 by 2027. We will have HS3 eventually. We will have Crossrail by 2019 and Thameslink by 2018. But I would argue that these incredibly valuable and important massive investments, they are in, in essence point-to-point -point solutions. They help people who have specific journeys, but they don't help the overall network. Now, as I said, I'm not a railway person. I'm an oil and gas guy. So when I first arrived, I stood on this bridge looking out over the railway on a 
cold winter's day with the sun shining. I could hear the birds sing, and I couldn't hear a train at all. And I stood there for five minutes, and not a train came by. And the chap said to me, said, this railway's full. Yeah, and it is. It is. That is the problem we've got. We've got infrastructure like this all over the country. It's actually only used about 1% of the time. And yet it's full. Now, in what other industry would you allow that to happen? In, what, in, in any of your industries, would you tolerate that? Of course not. So we have to use technology, and this is why I go back to signaling. We have to use different ways of controlling trains to fundamentally unleash the capacity that exists on our railway. And luckily, that technology does exist. Digital train control, if those of you did, you came here today on the tube, if you came on the Victoria line or on the Northern line, you came on a digitally controlled train, a train with digital signaling, and we can apply that to Britain's national railways. And if we do it, we can unlock enormous capacity we can run up to, we think, in dense urban networks, at least 40% more trains. But because we can run more trains, we can make better connections, have different stopping patterns, so improve the connectivity across our country. Because we will remove all of the fixed signaling systems, we'll, our trains will be much more reliable. How many times have you been delayed because signaling problems outside Slough or wherever? All of that will be, be gone. Our railway will be safer. 80% of the signals that are passed by a train when the signal's read and the train carries on past it, 80% of that occurs because of driver inattention. With digital train control, we remove that. My workforce is safer because I don't have to send them out onto the railway in the middle of the night to fix a signaling problem because the signaling is on the train. And of course, because trains don't stop and start at red and green lights, they just slow down because they know there's congestion ahead. They just slow down and then speed up again. We can significantly reduce environmental emissions. And of course, for passengers, digital train or the digital railway offers a, a world of opportunity as well. Today, when you walk onto a station, you have to sort of puzzle your way through this board of information. How am I going to get home? Especially at a time of disruption. What we want is to actually provide you with personal information about how you get to where you need to get to. So you don't have to navigate the complexity of the railway. The railway is there for you as a customer. And of course, for me, with my own workforce, you know, there are many advantages that I can see for the, when we have a digital railway to keep my people safer and to make the infrastructure more reliable. You know, using the trains themselves as the monitoring system for the track, live data downloads from trains, live video download from trains, so that I know exactly what the ride condition is on the train in real time and can go out there and intervene long before we currently do today. Now, I think that the secret of, of change is about focusing on the future, not about sort of fighting the past, not about, you know, trying to sort of knock what's happened in the past, because the signaling system and the control systems that we've had in the past have served us enormously well, and continue to, by the way. But the reality is that if we don't tackle this problem fast, we are going to hit a, a crisis. And the challenge for us is to change before we have to. So how do we do that? Well, we've got to talk more about the challenges of the future. We must be more open with the public about the challenges of growth in our industry, about the enormous opportunity that rail, better rail connectivity offers people in this country. We've got to build a strong coalition in a very fragmented industry. We've got train operating companies, freight operating companies, we've got governments, we've got regions, we've got infrastructure owners and operators like Network Rail. How do we get everybody behind something which is going to transform the industry? It's a complete industry transformation. Everybody has to get behind it. And that includes the politicians. Politicians love to announce new railways. They really do. They love to announce new stations. 
how can I get them excited about announcing a new signaling system? It's really difficult, yeah? But that's the challenge that I've got, and um, because it's the biggest opportunity I think we face. We need to be clearer with the passengers about what's in it for them. If I talk to passengers about I'm going to have digital train control and, you know, they're not, you know, ERTMS, and e I could give them acronyms out of, you know, every year. They're not interested. What they're interested in is, am I going to get more seats? Are the trains going to be reliable, more reliable? Am I going to have more trains? Am I going to have Wi-Fi? Are you going to give me better information? Is it going to be cheaper? We need to talk to our passengers in terms that excite them, not about the technology that excites us. And it's a bit like the identifying the barriers bit is, I go now back to my North Sea experience. When we developed the underwater manifold center, which we didn't know how to do, what we did is we said, what, is, what are the things that we don't know how to do? What is the plan for addressing each one of those problems? Who's going to do it? By when? We had a really clear structured plan for identifying those barriers and knocking them over. Too often in industries like rail, we just look at barriers and say it can't be done. And I say to my people, don't tell me it can't be done. Tell me what the barriers are, and then we'll work out how we overcome them. You know, if you, in many industries, if you don't innovate, you will go out of business. Somebody will take you over. Your brand dies. Part of the problem that I have is that that won't happen in the railway industry. Yeah? Network rail or, or the rail infrastructure is not going to go out of business if we don't do this. But my God, if we don't address this together soon, <laughs> that is the challenge we face. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>